you know that this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. You know what Memorial Weekend Memorial Day weekend is about, right? It's not National Barbecue Day. So many people stop and think, hey, we're going to do a barbecue. But really and truly, you know, Memorial Day is to remember those who gave their life in service for the country. I've heard it said this way. There are two people who would give their life for you to secure your freedom. One of them is Jesus Christ. The other is the American military service person. And we need to honor those folks for the sacrifice that they made. Because they gave their lives to secure our freedom as a country. They gave their lives. You know, there's a difference between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Veterans Day, we honor those who served, who still may be with us, but those who served. Memorial Day is to remember those who gave their life in service for the country. To secure the fact that we can meet here freely and worship together. And that we have that opportunity. And that is, has nothing to do with the message. But I think that's a message in itself that if we look and go, look at what we have been given because of the sacrifice of others. Now, if we take it to the next level and look at what we have been given because of the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, as we wrap up the series on the holiness of God, we have talked about what is holiness. We've talked about the nature of God. We have talked about, even last week, coming before a holy God. How do we do that? Today, is to me, is where it kind of culminates together. How it pulls together. Why holiness? We know what it is for God. We know how we can come before God, but you know why? How does that apply to us? Because we... Get to be holy because of Jesus. If you will, take your Bibles. Turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2. We've got several passages we're going to hit. And only one of them is in here. So I'm going to make you do some more looking up. Have you all enjoyed? I've actually, I'm, going to, I'm not going to ask you if you've enjoyed looking up the passages. But I'm going to say this. It's been enjoyable for me to watch folks grab it and they'll flip through and find it. One of the nice things, I know some folks really enjoy the electronic version of the scripture and go for it, okay? But sometimes it's still nice to hear this. Because there's something about the pages in a Bible. Now, I'm going to go, I'm gonna go off on a, on a tangent here for just a second. You know, I wish, I wish the pages in the Bible were just a little bit thicker. Just a little bit thicker. I have had tendencies to to tear them as I'm turning. But my biggest complaint is this. When I take notes, if I don't use the right pen, oh, it bleeds through and you're looking and going, I don't know which page those notes are on. (laughs) Which is another reason I've told you all this before. This is the Bible I preach out of. I have very few notes in it because if I have too many notes in it, I'll get distracted. But uh, in my other Bibles that I've had, I've actually had to take some of them and put them aside. It's like I can't read my notes in them anymore because they bled. Or if you don't use the right highlighter. Anyway, I'm going to go off that tangent. We're going to go back. We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. And Peter is talking here. And in verse 9, he starts with it and says this. But you, he's speaking to believers... You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people, and you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy." Pray with me if you would. Fathers, we look into your word this morning to talk about where holiness kind of culminates with us and why you set up what you did. 
Father, speak to us this morning. We want to hear from you. God, I guess the better prayer would be this. Help us to hear what you're saying because, God, you always speak. Help us to hear you this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice something here. Uh, you know, if we look at the, at the Old Testament, that you had to have a priest to be able to come before God. Nobody could just come before God. You had to have a priest. Well, Jesus kind of broke that because now he's not out of the tribe of Levi. He's from the tribe of Judah. But now he is the holy priest. We're talking about we have a new high priest. You remember, we, if you were here last week, you remember that. We now have a high priest in Jesus Christ which gives us the opportunity to be able to approach God. And because of that, look at what Peter's saying. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Do you realize that that means because through Jesus Christ, because of our relationship to God through Jesus Christ, because we have been adopted as a child of God, we are now considered a holy priesthood. We, we have access to God. I do not have to go through someone else. It's through Jesus. But because of my relationship with Jesus, I have direct access to God. Because of a holy God. He is holy. Now, because of what Jesus Christ has done for me, He has died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb. He rose from the grave. I have the opportunity for His sacrifice his burial, his death, his resurrection to be on my part, in my place. He has taken my stead. I can now approach God because I'm a royal priesthood. I am a holy, don't notice what that says, a holy nation. A holy nation. What would you consider a holy nation? If we look at the definition of holiness, what is a holy nation? Does anybody fit the bill of a holy nation? Nobody can fit the bill of a holy nation. I don't care what flag you fly. I don't care who you pay your allegiance to. Even the great state of Texas. It's not a holy nation. But when you look at the nation, who makes up a nation? Who makes up a nation? Not a rhetorical question. Tell me. Who makes up a nation? People. people. To make up a nation, what does a nation need to have for the people? What do the people need to have to make up a nation? A leader, but don't they need to have something in common? Do we, do we, if you think about this for a second, you think about the United States of America. What makes us a nation is the people, and we have to look at it generically here, okay? Do we have something in common? We all desire freedom, right? We all desire freedom. If I did not desire freedom, you know, there's a lot of countries that I could move to. I don't have to worry about it because I wouldn't have freedom. You realize that, uh, you think about this, it is our choice to live here. We were born here. Most of us are born here. I was born here. I had a choice. I could stay here or I could move. But to make up a nation, to make up the nation of the United States, it takes people and it takes something in common. Now let's look at this holy nation that we're talking about here. Who makes up this holy nation? Believers in Jesus Christ. Okay, so what do we have in common as believers in Jesus Christ? If we make up a nation, what do we have in common? Salvation. Faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That pulls us together. Now, if you look, I'm going to take it a little bit further here, okay? Let's look at the makeup of the United States of America. Let's look at the makeup of the United States of America. I don't have this written down, so... I, so I'm not going to throw you out some statistics. Do you know how many different ethnicities there are within the United States of America? Do you know how many languages there are within the United States of America? A bunch. 
You've got tall people. You have vertically challenged people. I'm not going to say short because I fit that bill. You've got all different kinds of people. Is there one person that you can look and go, American, 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 Texan. No, I throw that one in joking. <laughs> can you look at somebody and tell? Not always. Can you do it with, the, with, with the, the, the holy nation that we're talking about? Can we look at somebody and go, as a believer, there's a believer, there's a believer. We should be able to. Have y'all noticed for, I want you to do this just real quick. Glance around this room. Just glance. I give you permission to turn around and look, honestly. Do you find anybody in here that looks like you? Seriously, did you find anybody in here that looks like you? I mean, you might resemble, but... This is the one time that I'm grateful that the Sinkfield twins are not here. You know, that one would have really been bad because they would have looked at each other and gone, yeah. Um, but you realize none of us look like each other. And that's okay. But we have the one thing in common, which is what? Belief in Jesus Christ. We are now set apart as a holy nation. That doesn't mean that I have a, we have borders. That just means we're a holy nation. And as a holy nation, do we not have access to God? We have access to God. The holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. We have access to Him. We have access to to him. Now, because we're in a different location, because we're in a sinful world, are we going to end up having to associate with non believers? I hope we do. Understand why I say that, because if you'll do this, if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want you to see something here because I'm going to take this a little bit further, okay? Stay with me. Don't let me lose you on this. Don't let your mind wander because it can if you're not careful. But 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting with verse 14, says this. Don't become partners with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between the righteous and the lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I dwell and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate or holy. Says the Lord, do not touch any unclean thing and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, we've seen this to where it says, don't be partners, or in some translations, don't be unequally yoked. But I want you to realize what it's talking about is we need to make sure that we don't just isolate ourselves. Well, let me ask you. If we live within the nation, the holy nation, can we function within a holy nation? Or do we need to function within the land that we live? I can actually function in both. Because I have to. I have to. If you read this passage, does this passage... Now, rhetorical question, so don't answer out loud. With this, pas pa this passage... It says, don't be unequally yoked. Don't have partnerships with unbelievers. Does that mean that I need to look at everybody I do business with and do business with only believers? Even though it was a rhetorical question, I love that folks answered. No. No, I said that because I figured somebody would say, oh, no. This talks about being partners. Let me ask you this. You read through this, what this is talking about is the closeness, my family, 
who I'm married to, who I am doing intimate life with. I've talked about this with with, with folks before. Look at Jesus. Who did Jesus hang with? Sinners. You realize that Jesus had been called a drunkard because he hung around with the folks that drank? Didn't say Jesus drank. How does he minister to them if he's not around them? But who did Jesus spend his time with? Who would you consider to be his partners? He had 12 men. That wasn't the only disciples, by the way. You realize that, right? Because if you read through the New Testament, it talks about the 70. But he had the 12. He had that 12 that he spent his time with. But he also wasn't considered the frozen chosen. He didn't just look at us and say, and it was kind of like this, and I know the numbers don't work, but it's like, uh, it's us four and no more. It's just us. Because folks realize that with this it says, who am I linked with, I am yoked with, that I am doing everyday life with, needs to be somebody that's a believer. But it never says to avoid everyone else. I can't avoid everyone else. Because if I avoid everyone else, how do people see who Jesus is? Do this, turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. I want you to see this this verse right here. Ezekiel chapter 37, starting with verse 26. It's one of those days I got to have these. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be a permanent covenant with them. I will establish and multiply them and will set my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. My sanctuary is among them forever. The nations will know that I am the Lord. Sanctify Israel. If people... See that God is a difference, makes a difference in my life. And I'm not amongst those that don't. How will they know? How will they know? I need to be holy. But I need to be amongst the people that aren't holy. Where is God's temple? Here. Here. And I take God's temple with me. So when I talk about the holiness, you realize that it's set amongst. The temple is set amongst the unholy so that they can see God. If we kept God hidden and we didn't tell people about him. We didn't tell them about Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made on the cross and that he was buried in a tomb and that he rose three days later and now he's sitting at the right hand of God and if I place my faith and trust in him and accept what he did on my behalf and say, I'm giving my life to you, Jesus, and I want you to live through me, if people don't see that, does it matter? How do other people see it? How do other people see it? If, if, if God has made me a holy priesthood and I am part of a holy nation and a royal priesthood, I got to be among the people. I got to let people know. And we're not just this little huddle of saying, it's only us, it's only us. We need to step out, we need to have open arms. We need to have open arms. We talked about this on Wednesday night. If you'll do this, turn to Proverbs chapter 13. And to me, this is where the rubber hits the road. 
This is where you look at it and you go, okay, now it's starting to make sense. Folks, do you know the reason that God came to make us holy? We're plan A. There's not a plan B. We're plan A. We're it. He wants us to share with others who He is, what He's done, so that folks can see it in our life and go, you know what? Jesus has made a difference. Trish was talking about, about the, the, the um, <clears throat> dealing with what do I need to take care of in my life so that people see who Jesus is in my life. And we got to talking about that. And one of the things was um, TV shows. There are some TV shows that we have enjoyed over the years that all of a sudden have just gone, Yunk! man, they've taken a turn. And it's kind of like, <sighs> okay. You know what? This is the end of the season. Okay. They ain't coming back until the fall. I can find something else to watch. I can find something else to do. What in my life is, 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 is showing that I've made a difference or that Jesus makes a difference. But do this. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 20 says this. The one who walks with the wise will become wise. But a companion of fools will suffer harm. Folks, here's what I want you to realize. We've been talking about this with Proverbs. That God gives us wisdom. He has given us wisdom. Do you know why He gives us wisdom? Any thoughts? To give it away. God doesn't give us wisdom just for our own good. God gives us wisdom to give it away, to share it. If God gives me wisdom in Scripture, do I just sit here and go, oh, no, 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 that's really good. I'm going to hold it to myself. Or does God give me wisdom in Scripture to go, hey, folks, let me show you what God showed me. Let me tell you what God's doing. Let me tell you how he's made it part of my life. And going through Proverbs has really kicked my tail because I'm stopping and going, do I have the wisdom that God wants me to have? Am I taking the wisdom that God wants me to have? Wait a minute, God. You mean I can get wisdom? Your wisdom from somebody else? Really? You would do that? That you would use somebody else to speak scripture into my life and show me something and go, oh, yeah, that's what that means. That's cool. I'm going to tell you this. There have been some wisdom over the last almost three years that you guys have provided me more than probably what I can remember. But I can look out and there are people whose faces I see that have provided God's wisdom to me. Which is the same thing as God has given, him, given us His holiness for us to show it to other people. Look at what He can do. Look at what God can do. Look at the difference that Jesus can make in your life. Look at this. So why is holiness... It has set me apart. I need to watch what I do. The one who walks with the wise will become wise. You know, I think about this. There are so many different professions that you can be involved with that as you start, you start out at this level, but you're working with someone. And I think about talking with Kevin. You know, while we were working on on rebuilding this room, He and I had a lot of conversations. And one of them was talking about when you are a plumber's helper, that's not a plunger, okay? You think of that as a plunger sometimes. But you have a helper. And a helper works with who, Kevin? A journeyman. Why would you put a helper with a journeyman? To learn. Hopefully your journeyman knows something, right? So, do you know who you put a journeyman with? A master. Why would you put a journeyman with a master? Why wouldn't you just take a helper and put him with a master? He's not ready. And I think about us, that God uses us, that I get all of the holiness of God that there is when I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But the wisdom comes along. So my, my holiness is there so that I am now, as I start to get, catch me here, 
the progression. Holiness is what? Set apart. A cleansing. An emptying out, if you would. It's a set apart. Okay, now, what do I put back in place of that? If I'm set apart, now what do I do? I always hated it when you would go somewhere and you'd be in this big group of people and they'd sort you out and they'd say, okay, if you're such and such and such and such, you come over here and stand over here. And then they walk away and they leave you and you're like, oh, so what are we going to do? Why are we here? Is there anything planned or you just get us out to make a smaller crowd? To where as God separates us out, as God brings His holiness and gives us His holiness through Jesus Christ, it has separated us out to do something. He has separated out our hearts and He wants to fill us with His wisdom so that that wisdom in turn is given out to others so that they can see it and go, Oh, do you realize this? This is, the, this is the part that hit me the other day. One of the first pieces of wisdom that you can receive from God is His love, that He loves you, that He wants to have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Now, I can share that with believers all day long, and you're like, what? Yep, yep, we're good, we're good, we're good. How do I share that wisdom with the world if I'm not actually out there rubbing some shoulders with them? Now realize scripture says I'm not to be unequally yoked. I'm not to be partnered with them so that that's who I'm running with because you realize that scripture also says that bad company does what? Corrupts good morals. Bad company can pull you down. So be careful who you are connected with because they can take you and yank you right straight down. I'll give you a quick example. When I was teaching school, Trish was doing what she was teaching. She was kind of on her own with doing homebound, but Trish could tell if I started going to lunch in the uh, teacher's lounge, my attitude would change. I see some teachers shaking their heads. You get to the teacher's lounge, and I know it wasn't my school, it was this. Did you, can you believe what happened? So-and-so did this, and then so-and-so did this, and this. Can you believe, can you believe this took place? I can't believe this, so let me tell you about this and this and this. And all of a sudden, it's like, I am in an area to where all of a sudden, all that was there was negativity, and talking down about the kids, I had another co-worker that every so often we'd look at each other and say, hey... Let's go to my classroom and eat lunch. We'd go to classroom. We'd talk scripture. Sometimes that had changed my company because I was in the wrong spot. I was still trying to, to provide the wisdom that God had given me. They didn't want to hear it. They weren't ready. But I can say this. When I quit teaching at that school and told them that I was going back into ministry full-time, not bivocationally, but I was going full-time, they all looked at me and went, do you realize the impact you've had on this place? And I want to look at them and go, no, not really. I had some teachers come up to me and say, thank you because you set an example. Especially when you and this other teacher, when y'all would go off and eat lunch elsewhere because you're like, I don't want to be a part of that. I need to change it. And I actually had one teacher look at me one time and say, after y'all did that, we started talking about y'all. And while we thought y'all were kind of uppity and snooty and didn't want to come socialize with us. And then one of the other teachers looked and said, well, it could be because y'all are always negative and down. And it took us a while. We went back to the teacher's lounge for lunch. But we had an impact on what was going on in that teacher's lounge. Then our lunch schedule changed and it messed up again. But I want you to see that how God can take the wisdom that he provides us and use it in a situation. I had a teacher there that was a believer, firm believer, had a master's in religious education like me, so we had a lot we could talk about. And we could talk about stuff and we could really, really discuss it. 
So when we went back to that teacher's lounge, that's what we started talking about. People didn't like that. But then we had some folks get involved with it, start to ask questions. To the point that I had one of my teachers that when her, when her husband passed away, she looked at me and she says, we don't go to church, but we're believers. And I would like to see if you would do my husband's funeral. Yes, ma'am, I'd do that. It was really strange. She says, but I know I can trust you because I've seen it in your life. And it's like, oh, good. I'm glad somebody's watching. It scares me that somebody's watching. It makes me stop and think about what I'm doing. But the holiness that God gives us, let's just, let's, just, let's just bring the whole thing back around full circle. Holiness is a setting apart. God is holy. God is set apart. There's none like Him. God imparts wisdom. God gives me His holiness because through Jesus Christ I can now approach God, which means I have direct access to God, which means I am now set apart as a royal priesthood, as a holy nation. I'm... Set in that as a believer in Jesus Christ. I have direct access to the holy, holy, holy God. And I want to be able to tell others. You realize you have that same access? You have that same access? Sometimes we need to remind fellow believers. You know what? We have access to to a direct God. We have a direct access to God. Because we are holy. Does that mean we're perfect? No. But we are seen as holy through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I would say this. If you're sitting here this morning and saying, I need that. I want that. Romans says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we are not holy. And that the wages of sin is death. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And with the mouth you confess, with the heart you believe that Jesus is Lord, Scripture says that you are saved. That's what you have to do. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. The believing part, you do right where you are. The confessing part, here in a minute when we sing a song, I'll be down here front. If you want to talk about it, we can talk about it. If you want to do it after church, we can do that. One of the best ways to confess it with your mouth, that means to let others know, is baptism. On June 12th, we're baptizing. We can set that up to say, hey, let's do it June 12th. Let's let folks know your old life is gone. You have a brand new life. Here's what it takes. Now you're considered... Holy. And you have direct access to God. Direct access to the God who spoke creation into being. All because of the holiness of God. Because of the holiness of God. And the one thing to think about is there's only one way to become holy. That's through Jesus Christ. He is the one thing that will satisfy. He is the only thing that will satisfy. He is the only thing that can bring holiness. The song we're going to do is a commitment song. I love the words to it. The first verse says this, holiness. Holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. And I think sometimes we need to be reminded that we are holy. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I would say, do that today. Experience that holiness. But believers, let's remind ourselves we need that holiness. We have that holiness. We need to be realizing that we are set apart to do something for what He wants us to do. What decision do you need to make for Jesus? Do you need to experience that holiness for the first time? Do we need to be reminded of that holiness and say, God, remind me of my holiness. Remind me of what you've done for me. Renew me. Help me to set apart. Help me to be careful of who I'm with. Not that I avoid, but God, help me to be cautious. Help me to surround myself with believers that are going to help lift me up. 
But God, at the same time, help me to be honest and open and use me. Use me, God. You can. I probably can't, but you can. Use me, God. What decision do you need to make for Jesus today? When we finish singing, the altar here is open. You want to come pray? Come pray. If you want to pray where you are at your seat, pray where you are at your seat. If you need to talk to me, I'll be right here. If you need to, like I said, after church, whenever. What decision do you need to make for God today? Pray with me if you would. Fathers, we come to this point. God, I thank you for your holiness. But God, I thank you that because of your holiness... You set a way for us to still be able to access you through Jesus Christ. God, because of his sacrifice, place our faith and trust in him of what he has done on our behalf. And God, to make him Savior, that we have access to you, directly to you. Father, I thank you for that. God, I pray if there is somebody this morning that needs to make a decision, I pray that they would do that. Father, we give you the glory for it. Father, remind us daily of the holiness that you have given us. And Father, why you set us apart and what you want to do with us. Father, we love you. We worship you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together.